It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alan Farns, whose theme is Appreciating the Great Value of the Earliest Surviving Copies of the Greek New Testament. Dr. Farns earned his BA from Brigham Young University in 2012 in Ancient Near Eastern Studies, his MA from Duke University in 2014 in New Testament Studies, and his PhD from the University of Birmingham in 2018. He is an independent scholar focusing primarily on New Testament textual criticism. He has published a monograph entitled Simply Come Copying, Direct Copies as Test Cases in the Quest for Scribal Habits. His volume examines manuscripts which are known copies of other extant manuscripts. Having discovered 22 so-called child manuscripts whose parent version is still known today, his letter-by-letter -letter examination of four of these manuscripts sheds light on how scribes went about their work and provides a methodology for future studies. In addition to this monograph, Dr. Farns has published articles in Papyrology and New Testament Exegesis. He is the principal editor of a festschrift that will soon be published by Brill. When he is not raising his three children as a full-time stay-at-home dad, Dr. Farns enjoys cycling through the Utah mountains. Put very simply, textual criticism is the practice of evaluating variant readings among disparate, disparate New Testament manuscripts. We must remember that no original copies of any New Testament books have survived the test of time. We do not have the actual papyrus on which the author of Matthew wrote his gospel. What we do have is over 5,000 manuscripts of the Bible in ancient Koine Greek which have survived the test of time. Although most of these manuscripts preserve most of the same wordings as other manuscripts, each and every manuscript of the Bible contains flaws, most minor, some major. Because these manuscripts were copied by hand by a human scribe, it is impossible for these manuscripts to be perfect in every way. Since these manuscripts vary at places, the task, the task of textual criticism is to determine which reading is the best reading. One simple example of the textual critic's task is found in Mark 1.1. Here the King James Version of the Bible reads, quote, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. An examination of the Greek manuscripts of this verse, however, show that some manuscripts disagree on how this verse should read. At least three ancient Greek manuscripts, one of which is generally accepted as the best and earliest complete copy of the New Testament, omit the words, the Son of God, therefore reading, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some may argue that the words, the Son of God, were added later as a result of title creep, the tendency for some scribes to embellish the titles of Jesus. Some places in the New Testament which simply have the name of Jesus are later embellished by scribes. For example, Galatians 6, 17 contains the name Jesus, which one scribe changed to Lord Jesus, another Lord Jesus Christ, and another Our Lord Jesus Christ. So some have argued that in Mark 1, 1, the Son of God was added as a result of tidal creep. Others have argued that the words the Son of God were written in the initial text by the writer of Mark, but they were later accidentally omitted by these three manuscripts. After all, every manuscript of Mark 1, 1 reads the Son of God except for these three. So the weight of the evidence is in favor of the Son of God being original. The reason that these words in these three manuscripts may have been accidentally omitted is a result of how Greek scribes wrote ancient Greek. Ancient Greek did not have spaces to separate words and wrote in what we would call today all capital letters. A reader read the text aloud and understood how to separate the words based on context and their knowledge of the Greek language. Additionally, certain sacred words were written in short form called nomina sacra or sacred names. Therefore, Jesus in Greek capitals is spelled Yesu, but, short, but the shortened nomen sacrum form is Yoda Upsilon with a line over to show this is an abbreviated word. In our example in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the initial text may have read Jesus Christ, the Son of God, which written in shortened Greek is Yesu Christu Huiu Theu, but without spaces, 
uh, is all scrunched together. Here's a really clean example from Codex Regius, an 8th century New Testament manuscript. Codex Sinaiticus writes it without the phrase Son of God as seen here, but a later corrector inserted the word Son of God written in nomina sacra form. It is easy to see how a scribe could be confused and how a scribe's eye could jump from one letter to another. If a scribe were to write Jesu Christu in nomina sacra form and then look back up at the, at the source in order to copy the next word, it is possible that the scribe would see the upsilon of Theu instead of the upsilon of Christu. The scribe would therefore think the line is finished, and the scribe would have therefore inadvertently omitted the last two words, which are, in English, the Son of God. This type of omission, called lapsus oculorum, a slip of the eye, caused by homoeteluiton, that Christu and Theu have similar endings, is extremely common. Sometimes whole verses are omitted due to this type of error. What we are left with is a convincing argument that a scribe may have added the words the Son of God in order to complete Jesus' title, and another convincing argument that a scribe may have omitted these words on account of difficulty copying words with the same ending. In the end, many more manuscripts do contain the word Son of God, and therefore most modern translations keep these words. Most Greek editions, however, print the Greek words, the Son of God, in brackets in order to show that these words are questionable. So here we've had one example of one of the main tasks of textual criticism. When faced with manuscripts that contradict one another, employ logic and knowledge of manuscripts in order to determine which reading is likely to have actually been written by the author. Triumphantly, many New Testament textual critics consider the task of uncovering the initial text with the authors which the authors wrote to be complete. Textual critics have therefore shifted their focus and goals. Many textual critics now do not attempt as much to reconstruct what the initial text would have been, but rather seek to understand what the varying forms of the text throughout time tells us about Christian history and the reception of the New Testament text. Still other text critics spend their time studying the lives of the scribes of the New Testament with the thought that if we can better understand how the scribes went about their work, then we can better understand how and why they made the changes, either intentional or accidental, which they made. Once we understand how and why they made these changes, we can then reverse their changes and arrive at a closer initial text. Textual criticism strives to ensure that we read the most original form of the New Testament as possible and hopes to reconstruct the form of the text which the authors wrote. While some scholars may be content to study the resultant text in its current literary form, textual critics hope first to establish what the authors originally wrote and then analyze the text after the text itself has been established. After all, why study the Bible if we are unsure if these words are what the original authors actually wrote. Textual criticism continues to be a living and vibrant discipline due to continuing discoveries of ancient manuscripts. Additional copies of the Greek New Testament are found often. Since the year 2000, 24 Greek New Testament papyri have been found and made available for, scho for scholarly study. This number will quickly become outdated, perhaps even before the publication of this book. New discoveries are occurring rapidly. These papyri, as with all papyri, have been analyzed in order to determine in which way they add to our knowledge of the text of the New Testament. Often these New, Testament, often these new discoveries further confirm the text which we already have. But some of these manuscripts present a radically different version of the text and may change much of what we thought we knew about the text. Another major reason why textual criticism is so important can be seen in the differences between the King James Version of the New Testament and modern translations. The King James Version of the Bible is a wonderful translation and has stood the test of time. The KJV delicately preserves the sentiment of the sacred text while conveying the meaning in understandable prose. The, because the KJV was, was published over 400 years ago and relied upon a Greek text from 500 years ago, more manuscripts are available to us today 
than were available to the KJV translators 400 years ago. In fact, the Greek text with which the KJV translators used, called the Textus Receptus, was based upon very few copies of the Greek text, and those copies were all copied hundreds of years, and in most cases, a thousand years, after Jesus' life. We are fortunate to have had so many discoveries and so much research performed concerning the text of the New Testament. We now have access to complete copies of the Bible which date to the 4th century and to fragmentary copies which reach all the way back to the 2nd century, over 5,000 copies of the Greek New Testament in all. The text critic's job is to update the text of the New Testament in light of recent discoveries. Latter-day Saints are in a wonderful position to benefit from and accept variant readings in the text of the New Testament. The eighth article of faith reads, We believe the Bible to be the Word of God, as far as it is translated correctly. The caveat, as far as it is translated correctly, al allows Latter-day Saints some wiggle room in their verbatim acceptance of the Bible. Unlike other Christians who believe the Bible is inerrant, Latter-day Saints are fortunate that our theology allows us to recognize the diversity and multiplicity of variant readings in the textual tradition of the New Testament. We should therefore not in any way be uncomfortable with questioning the reading of the original text of the New Testament, and we should welcome with open arms new manuscript discoveries which will illuminate and strengthen our understanding of our sacred book. Being aware of important variant readings in the text of the New Testament can enhance our use of the King James Version of the Bible. Unfortunately, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we have a tradition, tradition of speaking ill of the Bible, largely due to the Eighth Article of Faith and because of Nephi's statements in 1 Nephi 13 about plain and precious truths being taken out of the Bible. Most LDS scholars, however, believe that these plain and precious things refer to whole books that were left out of the Bible and that the books that are currently in the Bible can indeed be trusted as accurately copied. Ancient books like First Clement, the Didache, the Shepherd of Hermas, and others perhaps should have been included in the Bible, but could have been part of the plain and precious things that were left out. Scholarly analysis of scribal habits consistently show that the Bible as we have it was copied incredibly carefully and that most errors were accidental and the result of scribes doing their best at a very difficult task. While we should welcome new manuscript discoveries and the text they contain, we should also be aware and be honest about certain problems and challenges that textual criticism brings. It has to be accepted that our earliest extensive copies are indeed late. One of the earliest extensive witnesses is called P46, or Papyrus 46, which is dated to around 200 AD. Scholars, however, continuously disagree concerning all paleographic or handwriting dating. Some scholars argue that Papyrus 46 should be dated to the end of the first century, while most argue for later dating. Papyrus 46 is the earliest witness to most of, but not all, of the Pauline corpus. If the 200 AD dating is reliable, then that means that the first extant copy of the Pauline corpus was copied 150 years after it was written. Not until the great codices of the 4th century, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, uh, not until then do we have more evidence for the Pauline corpus. So for Paul, our earliest textual evidence is Papyrus 46, which is dated to 200, and then Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vatic Vaticanus, both dated around 350 AD. The picture is nearly identical for the Gospels. We do have tiny fragments which have been controversially dated very early. Papyrus 52, a fragment containing five verses of John, is dated to 125 AD. So we have a few fragments of a few verses of the Gospels, but not until Papyrus 75, dated to around 200 AD, do we have extensive text. Papyrus 75 contains 19 chapters of Luke and 15 chapters of John. Another papyrus, Papyrus 66, also dated to 200 AD, contains John, 
Papyrus 45, dated to 250, contains four chapters of Matthew, eight chapters of Mark, eight chapters of Luke, and four chapters of John, and 14 chapters of Acts. So for most of Matthew and Mark and some of Luke, our earliest extant text is witnessed in the great codices of the 4th century. Therefore, much of our manuscript evidence for the Gospels is at least 250 years later than when they were written. Since there is no text for this intervening period, we have no way to track the evolution and changes in the text, and anything could have happened. So we must be honest about the limitations of the New Testament manuscript evidence. Nonetheless, there is reason for hope. Since we have over 5,000 extant copies of the ancient Greek New Testament, we also have an abundance of, of, of evidence available to us. Not a single one of these copies says something like, Jesus is not the Christ. They all agree on the important and salvific principles of the gospel, that Jesus lived and died for our sins and, and was raised on the third day. Even if a single copy of the New Testament were to be found that contradicted these principles, we would still have 5,000 other copies of the Bible to refute it. So while our extant copies of the New Testament were indeed copied hundreds of years after the events that took place, the majority of the copies agree on the important principles of the gospel, that Jesus is the Christ, the author and finisher of our faith.